Friends, if you trust me with your most viable possession, your time, please give me a minute to explain to you a potential new series on Hey Bricky, but as always, I need your help to make it work. You see, Disney has a pretty unwatchable YouTube channel, and I think this channel is unwatchable by design. I don't think it's an accident. This channel is the Disney Research Hub, and I think it's unwatchable because this channel isn't designed to entertain. I believe, and this is just me guessing, it has to exist for grants and patents and just basically proving that they're sharing the research that they're coming up with. So these videos are absolutely unwatchable unless you're a huge design and theme park nerd, which is what I am and I'm assuming some of you are as well. But I'm pretty sure these videos aren't meant to be entertainment, which is convenient because they are the furthest thing from entertainment, which is where I step in. I've been having so much fun explaining Disneyland forward to everybody. I thought, why not take these research hub videos and break those down as well? And basically doing what a big theme on this channel is. We take big ideas and we break them down into easy to understand bite-sized chicken nuggets. So I figure it's worth a try. And if no one watches, no one comments, then I'll just move along like I always do. But in case you do enjoy this, it's worth giving it a shot but I wanted to explain why this video series may feel a little bit different, and let's go. Bricky here, explaining to you today, soft pneumatic actuator design. Yeah, rolls right off the tongue. <laughs> but today, we're explaining all that in a fun way. Disney Research has figured out a new way to optimize animation. The easiest way to explain this is it's through a multi-level skin. Those are my words. But as you'll learn today, this skin can be animated for storytelling inside of the theme parks. And it will provide Disney a way to put a lot more animation into the theme parks at, I believe, a lower cost, a lower amount of energy, a lower amount of weight, meaning things that they couldn't easily animate before are now gonna be possible. So in a nutshell, it's gonna be an easy way to create some animations with a low impact delivery system. So today we're not talking about the star of the show, we're talking about all the little pieces that can make a show even better. Friends, we're talking about what Disney fans love, kinetic energy inside of attractions through animation. So let's jump in real quick. Imagine an exterior skin that animates, but imagine on the inside of that, is a skin that you don't see, that once a small jet of air pushes inside of it, that air has to navigate through that cavern, and that cavern informs the exoskeleton, or the exoskin, how to animate, how to react. Basically, using air inside of an object to make the outside appear as if it's moving or doing something that's pre-calculated. And imagine everything that you're seeing that looks like wires. Those are sensor pressure points. Think of them as rubber bands to keep it simple. So when the pressure of the air fills the chamber, those elastic points react to that pressure, creating animation. Again, we are talking about small pieces inside of a big show, but small pieces that Disney would have never thought about animating before until now. So as always, what we do on this channel, let's start with the easiest to understand concept first and work our way up to the most difficult. I'm so glad you showed up. I hope you enjoy this new series. If you do, comment below. Let me know that this is something you'd like for me to do more of. And as always, if you wanna support the channel, please consider subscribing and maybe grabbing our Walt 1901 hoodie. It'll only be available while the channel's in the 40Ks. And friends, we're already 24% of the way through. Yes. So let's move over to our first example of how these little, I'm assuming, 3D printed pieces along with an air cannon can make amazing animations happen in the theme park. But to break this first one down, we're gonna have to go back to the sunlight hours because uh, it was a little bit busy here during the day. So I waited for the crowds to go away to make this intro so it'd be easy for you to understand and follow along what we're getting into today with our new series. I'm thinking about calling it Parks and Crafts, or maybe Walt Disney Imagineering Explained, or maybe Imagineering for Dummies, with me being the dummy. And I will, of course, link the video that we're breaking down today if you're really looking for a solid two minutes of entertainment. <laughs> 
All right, here is our first example. We're gonna start easy and work our way up to more complex examples and also more complex executions of this technology and how we could envision it being implemented in the Disney parks. But let's look at these two frogs. It's subtle, but if you really look at the frog on the right, you can notice that its animation is steps and beyond the one over on the left that simply looks like a balloon being blown up. But the frog on the right, its articulation and its movement is very specific to the throat without making the shoulders and the head and the overall figure rock. You can see that that inhale exhale is in a very specific articulated part of the actual character. And this has got me excited seeing nothing but potentials. So let's break down why this is exciting, okay? Because if Disney was doing a whole scene, right? They would never make fully articulated animatronics for all the background characters. They would make them simply like sculpted frogs, maybe a little bit of cartoon-like movement where the head sits on a dowel rod and moves up and down, or maybe just the actual placement, the stage that they're on would do a little bit of moving. But that would be the most that they could justify for the background characters. However, with what we're seeing here, you could have an entire background of frogs all over this particular scene that we're given as an example, and they could all be breathing, inhaling, exhaling at different moments, just adding a whole bunch of kinetic energy in the background of a very complicated scene. So in this particular example, yeah, this isn't the star of the show, but the background environment adds so much energy, so much kinetic energy, that it makes the central character, you know, the million dollar character, feel even more real. It makes the storytelling feel even more immersive when everything around you feels like it's living, breathing, and feeling real. So just imagine the three levels of storytelling that's in every Disney scene. There is the look around point. This would be the rocks that you would float around in your boat. There would be the center point that you're supposed to look at, which in this example would possibly be Tiana. And then there's the background, the infinity layer that's supposed to make it feel like it goes on forever and that this is a real world that you're lost in. Imagine that infinity layer full of little living, breathing frogs all around you. It would sell everything that you're seeing in the focus level and then in that first look around point. And that could easily help be pulled off with these little bitty frogs, with what we're referring to to make it simpler as the reaction skin, where on the internal mechanism of these frogs, when the little air cannons go off, they go through a channel of articulation on the inside that puppeteers the exoskeleton or the exoskin that we see on the show scene. Therefore, with a pretty low level investment, not a lot of technology, we could see a full scene be animated. And that's the thing, when you look at these technologies, you have to think about how does this small piece fit into a much larger puzzle? And this is our first example. This is the, the ground level example of this. We're gonna get a little bit more complex and then later on today's video, we're gonna talk about what Disney does best, adding technologies together. So right now we're just looking at the frog, but there's a way to even upscale this. But first, let's go from a frog to a full on human and think about how we could use this technology in fully animatronic characters to save costs, but add a lot more articulation and animation to the show experience. In our second example, we're gonna break down the obvious. Audio animatronics are very expensive and they've only gotten more expensive as the technology has developed, creating a more expansive entertainment experience for guests who now are no longer totally amazed at just seeing a talking robot, but they need to see fully articulated characters telling them a convincing story. That's why we rarely see attractions like Pirates of the Caribbean that have a hundred audio animatronics inside of it and more things like Rise of the Resistance that have about eight. That's my guess off the top of my head. So to keep budgets moving accordingly, Disney has to be very smart about how many animatronics can they allocate per attraction. But this technology changes a little bit of that because Disney could cut some costs implementing what we're seeing right here, therefore allowing an individual animatronic not to be so expensive because some of the heavy lifting is being done by a more affordable animation option. So imagine using this version of the reaction skin that we're looking at right now from the Disney Research Channel. So if you use the reaction skin to animate the fingers 
on a large scale animatronic, this would give you the ability to cut down costs by only having to put a certain amount of these air jets, and I'm assuming somewhat 3D printed, I mean, very elaborately printed, but creating these fingers with this technique has got to be way less expensive than fully articulated animatronics inside of each of the digits. But not only does this example show us fingers on a hand being animated, but think about something like the tentacles on a character like Davy Jones. Being able to make lots of articulated action happen with a relatively lower cost by using this method with the air pumps making the animation happen. Now it would have a limited range, so this isn't a replacement for overall characters, but you could see how certain items of the characters could be scaled down on their costs, but still delivering a nice animated character because if the head and eyes are all moving around, you're not gonna closely be paying attention to a moving hand or the tentacles in a beard. So if you're following along with me, Doing this would lower the cost of an individual character, therefore hopefully giving Disney the ability to add more characters into attractions because they can cut some corners with this technology, but we don't really recognize that it is a cut corner because I guarantee you, you couldn't tell the difference between like, bro, that was an air pump and not a robot. <laughs> <laughs> and then I hope Disney would use this to be able to up the volume of animatronics inside of an attraction versus just scaling down overall. It would be nice to get back to the days of Pirates or the Haunted Mansion where there was characters everywhere versus just a few select one in each scene because the cost has gotten so outrageous to deliver these fully animated animatronics that feel so lifelike. This could add a little bit of that life, but do so on a budget. If you are having a hard time telling the difference between the frog on the left and the frog on the right, you can surely see the difference between the finger animation on the left and the one on the right. Both of these fingers are just being blown up with air. However, the one on the left is just like inflating a balloon, whereas the one on the right, the air is hitting a reaction point on the interior skin that is causing that animation that we see on the exterior skin. And by doing so with, I'm assuming, a much reduced weight and also a reduced cost, this opens up the potential to do a lot of really interesting stuff and more than just characters. But the difficult thing that Disney is working with right now is that audiences' expectations have gotten so sophisticated that when they do cut these corners, we are a pretty particular consumer. They need to go above and beyond to make sure it doesn't feel like the corner has been cut. And I don't think that this could be detected if it was part of an overall animatronic with lots of robotic pieces doing the regular movements. And this just being a little something sprinkled in, I think this is a corner that Disney could cut because nobody would actually be able to recognize this floating by in a boat. It's pretty amazing. I think the genius thing about Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway that was lost on a lot of guests is how it doesn't animate the central characters, it animates the background. And often when we think about animatronics and animation and attractions, we think about characters. But Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway does it completely backwards, making sure that every environment you go into, that is where the animation and articulation lies. So let's imagine Disneyland's version of Pandora where with this technology, the set and the environment that we're living in can be fully animated and articulated all around us with just using the animated skin that we're looking at today, where air pumps could make everything around you feel like it's living and breathing. Imagine using this technology to make roots that come down from the ceiling that can grip on all the metal and steel that are holding up the cavern that we are floating through. And also imagine while we're floating, what if all of the walls around us were pulsing and breathing just like this small sample of an animated worm. But now imagine an entire tunnel breathing, inhaling, exhaling as we are cruising through it. Maybe we've accidentally just stumbled inside of a living, breathing organism. Now these are just two examples off the top of my head, taking the IP of Pandora and taking this technology to create living spaces that we can travel through. But I think it gets your imagination going where in Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway, where the background comes to life, imagine that background coming to life, but with this technology. Pretty affordable, not a lot of tech, but something that could truly change an environment and get people talking. Also, when it's combined with other technologies.
which is what we're getting to next. Let's use Rise of the Resistance as our inspiration for example number four of this reaction skin technology. And that's just my term to make it so much easier to understand. It's a reaction skin. You put air into it, it reacts. We'll just keep it dumb dumb because that makes it easier to follow along with. But if we look at Rise of the Resistance as our example, Rise's technology borrows from the long lineage of other successful Disneyland attractions. Haunted Mansion, Ratatouille, the Tower of Terror, Pirates of the Caribbean, and Indiana Jones just to mention a couple of attractions that Rise borrows from to give us an entirely new experience but based off of all of the technology that laid before it. The best artists, the best attractions stand on the shoulders of giants that came before them. So now imagine everything that I have shown you today in these examples. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna stack technologies on top of this new technology of the reaction skin. Trademark, I, I just trademarked it, Disney. <laughs> so imagine all of these little articulated animated pieces that I've shown you today. Now imagine them painted, but not painted flat, painted like a painting with shadows, shading, highlights, textures all put into them. So what you're looking at is something that looks very real but even more real with this animation that's happening inside of it due to the little air cannons. And now let's think about adding projection technology, where if the projectors were perfectly aimed at certain spots of this articulation, it could take that animation and elevate the experience. And we could go even a step further because obviously all of these pieces that we've seen today are somewhat hollow on the inside. That's how the air travels in through its corridor, its little maze that creates this reaction that we've been breaking down today. So imagine that interior with small lights inside of it to make it glow from the inside. So let's go back to our frogs in the beginning of all this. Imagine the frogs having moonlight shined on them from digital projectors that are perfectly hitting each frog to make it look like the moonlight is touching them. But then also think about inside of them, a small glowing orb that would make their throat sort of have a little subtle glow as the wind comes in, pushes out that animation and brings it back in, the glow would go down. Just imagine what it would look like seeing all of those little frogs or little creatures inside of a Pandora for that example. Just imagine this technology you're seeing of the reaction skin combined with painting projections on the exterior and interior because this is something that's not crowded with a lot of robotic pieces, it's crowded with air. But what we're looking at, this is just where it starts from frog to finger to full on walking animated character where the same technology they do believe if pushed further could create a character that could be autonomous and walk on its own with air blowing through its interior skeleton making the exoskeleton or skin look as if it's fully animated. So from one finger to fully animated character this is how technology slowly grows and scales to make more things that seem unreal to us right now fully possible in the future. And why this idea of a self-walking character with this technology impresses me is because it would be extremely affordable, much lower weight load. It would also use a lot less power and machinery. I don't know that it could run a mile, but just walking back and forth across a set, it could be pretty impressive and doesn't break the bank in the process. If the walking was being done by small air pumps flowing through the inner skin to make it look like to us that the outer skin is fully autonomous, able to move on its own. I love how ideas start small and can just scale and scale and scale along with imagination and innovative technology, which is kind of two of the things that drew me into loving Disneyland so much. I could clearly see that everything in here was from an artist's table, an artboard, but it had been crafted with love and care, using the technologies available at the time to create an experience unlike anything that we see out in the real world, 
where in this fake world, everything can be perfectly curated in a way that you just can't do out in the wild. So friends, this is not only just the beginning of this technology, but it's also just the beginning of this new series. If you enjoyed today's video, please let me know with a comment or a thumbs up, and I make you a deal. Whenever this video gets to 20,000 views, I'll launch episode two, and it'll be available right here. Not only do I appreciate you, but I appreciate your time, and I hope you felt this video was worth it.